line was exceptional. I've had to train to get very, very, very proficient. Gold medalist and Paralympic champion representing New Zealand. You're always adjusting and adapting to conditions, and that's the thing that young players have don't quite realise these days. <laughs> Listening to the Hyundai High Performance Hour. Yeah, good evening. Welcome into the show, the Hyundai High Performance Hour. Remember, our website is hph.co.nz, hph.co.nz. If you go to our Facebook page and like us on Facebook, and you can answer our very simple quiz question, um, and you could be our weekly prize winner as well. That is hph.co.nz. Link through to the Facebook page and answer our very simple quiz question on tonight's show. And tonight's show is all about uh, a man who won three times the sprint jersey, the green jersey on the Tour de France. He uh, rode the Tour on 12 occasions. He had over 100 professional wins during his career. These days is a, a technical advisor with the Orica Green Edge team and was out here in New Zealand for a couple of days with uh, Shepherds Industries. They, of course, the company that uh, owns Avanti Plus stores around the country and Avanti Plus um, they distribute Scott bikes. So they have two great brands, Avanti and Scott. And uh, Robbie McEwen, our guest on the show, is a brand ambassador for Scott. So next up on the show, the Hyundai High Performance Hour, we will hear from Robbie McEwen. For a luxury bathroom at half the price, see the team at DIY Bathrooms. They do plans, products and give advice that's guaranteed to save you thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. Stock's nearly all gone, so this is the last week to get the one metre round corner shower with 6mm safety glass and top quality runners for smooth siding for only $449. Limit of two per customer. DIY Bathrooms, 18 Piranha Road, Glenfield and 8 Car Road, Mount Roskill. Liz from Walker and Hall. Give your girl the ring of her dreams while you sleep easy with 500 days no interest and no payments. That's 500 carefree days for purchases of $500 and over. Q card lending criteria, fees, terms and conditions apply, but it's just so easy. Visit walkerandhall.co.nz or come in store. Offer only available for a limited time. Walker and Hall helping Kiwi shine since 1899. To make great bacon... You have to start with the right ingredients. Kiwi butchers know that only bacon made from the freshest pork, grown right here in the greatest farming nation in the world, can carry the guarantee of the 100% New Zealand pork rosette. Look for it when you next buy your bacon. Insist on quality. Insist on 100% New Zealand bacon. Trending now on Radio Sport. Hey, Ed here. David Tua's fight against Alexander Ustinov is in doubt due to injury. Will he be ready to fight at the end of the month? Tell us what you think on Facebook. Darcy writes about how we may not get to see the Black Caps play Bangladesh. And surfer Anastasia Ashley has a unique warm-up regime before she hits the water. Watch the full video online. Twitter at Radio Sport NZ. Facebook.com slash Radio Sport NZ. And at radiosport.co.nz. The Hyundai High Performance Hour with Andrew Dewhurst. Proudly brought to you by Hyundai New Zealand. Well, 12 times, 12 times a Tour de France rider, three times the winner of the green jersey and 12 stage wins. And that's just the Tour de France. Many, many other stage victories and indeed uh, race victories throughout his illustrious career. We're talking with one of the very best in recent generations in road cycling. He's certainly uh, a hero to the uh, to the sport in Australia, but well known around the world. Robbie McEwen joins us on the uh, High Performance Hour. Robbie, thanks for your time. You're in New Zealand for a very short visit here with uh, Shepherds. Uh, Avanti have brought you out. You enjoying the... Uh the, the Auckland winter, it's not bad. Yeah, I am. I, I looked at the weather and decided, yes, I'll come over. It uh, seems that the sunny weather we've had at, at my place on the Gold Coast has blown across here. So, no, great to be here. Uh, and Del Woodford with me as well in studio. And, and Del, of course, we're, I mean, you're like a pig and muck here, aren't you, in terms of uh, this particular interview. Can you put Robbie's career into perspective for, for our audience? 
Uh, for me, and, and you know how long I've followed cycling for, Andrew, uh, Robbie's the greatest sprinter that I've seen, uh, certainly of the of the generation of sprinters. Uh, you know, we take Ab, you know, Abdu Jabarov, Mario Cipollini, Eric Zabel. But these guys were well protected in the peloton with sprint trains, guys looking after them. Robbie McEwen rode for a team that often had other uh, agendas in the race, you know, the yellow jerseys, etc. So he had to ride by himself a lot, fight his way to the front, ride off other teams. His skill to do that and fight for stage wins sets him apart for me uh, from any other sprinter of this generation. Yes, yeah, so, and that makes it very clear that, uh, Robbie, that was your stock and trade. You were a sprinter, yeah? Yeah, I was a sprinter. I was a, what they call uh, the French expression, a, a sprinter, pur sang, uh, a full-blooded sprinter. Um couldn't really do much else all that well, but I could manage and get through the races. You know, I was not a not a shadow of a climber. Um, couldn't really time trial, but um, you know, when it came to sprinting, that's that's what I was built for. Let's let's go back to the start first, and and part of this interview is we we want to explore what it is to sprint down the Champs Elysees at the end of the Tour de France, and you've been there, done that. What year did you win on in in Paris? Uh, I won for the first time in Paris in 99 and I won again there in 2002. So we, we want to take our audience uh, down that final sprint and uh, we'll do that later in the interview and I can't wait for that. But it, it, it what began for you in BMX and, and uh, perhaps unusually because it seems the modern cyclist goes uh, track and when they won a couple of medals on the track, they go to the road. But you bypassed that, didn't you? You pretty much went from BMX and straight into road. Well, I sort of dropped myself from BMX. I, I, I stopped racing BMX when I was 17 and had a, a sort of a year off just going surfing and, you know, got my got my car licence and all that sort of stuff, going out and having fun. And then I decided I wanted to get back into bike riding. And I had a mate, a uh, guy by the name of Darren Smith, who was tragically killed in 1992 um, just post-Barcelona Olympics, which he rode at. Um, he was a good mate of mine in BMX. He'd started cycling and been really successful. I sort of followed his progress and I thought, oh, well, I want to give cycling a go. And I, I was keen to actually ride on the track. And I, I went out to a training night and um, had a blast around on someone else's bike. And after a couple of weeks of going to the trainings, someone else said to me, if you want to be good on the track, you need to train on the road as well. So you should get a road bike. So I went and did that. And, and you know, I, straight away I was racing both track and road. Track used to be the summer season in Australia and road was in the winter till the criteriums really started to pick up and you could do that all through the summer as well. So I was mixing both of them and um, to me it didn't matter, I just loved it all. So Robbie, uh, you know, the track obviously important, your skills at BMX very important. How have they translated into being a sprinter? You know, BMX is, is tough, physical, eight up on the track. So did that help you as a road sprinter? Um, well, developing into a sprinter on, on the road, uh, my BMX background certainly helped me. Um, you know, I think genetics helped me more than anything. I'm just lucky in, in that respect that, uh, like I said before, I was built to sprint. Um, that's what I'm naturally good at. But, you know, my BMX background, certainly the, the years of doing it is a very, very explosive sport. You know, you've got to get out of the gate and get up to top speed as quick as possible. It's the same principle in a, in a road race and to win a sprint. But it's, you know, getting through that first 200k and then <laughs> kicking mm. up to top speed and holding everybody off. So there, there's, a, there's a lot to, to, um, to pick up in between. Let's just, just talk about the, the, the physiology uh, because uh, we've just seen the Tour de France and uh, the commentators will go on about the different frames, the, uh, the climbers who are the lighter uh, athletes and, uh, and the sprinters, they, they call them these giants. Um, Robbie, you know giant. Now, now, I mean, put it into context for our listeners in terms of cycling. Uh, were you a typical in terms of your, your physiology and your size for a sprinter or are you on the smaller side for the sprinters? I'd be on the smaller side for the sprinters. There are a couple of guys that are about my size. Mark Cavendish is roughly the same size as me. Um, also a few other guys. I think the real leveller in cycling is that it's it's power-to-weight ratio but also the the. Uh, surface area that you present to the wind. I mean, it's all about aerodynamics as well. And the bigger you are, the more wind you've got to push out of the way. So um, whether you're big or small doesn't make a, a hell of a lot of difference until you start looking at the little things like the um, the last couple of hundred metres, if it's slightly downhill or a faster downhill, a little bit uphill, then guys start to come into their own. The big guys with a lot of weight and a lot of power, they really um, have an advantage on a, a downward sort of sprint um the smaller guys 
like myself, the, the lightweight sprinters have a big advantage when the road starts to go up. So it's just an uphill sprint, a bit of a drag. So what are your numbers? When you were racing at your peak, uh, height, weight, all the rest of it, what were you? Uh, 171 centimetres, 68 kilo. So, you know, I, I weighed about the same. I think when Cadell Evans won the tour, he was 68 kilo. We weighed exactly the same. He was probably eight centimetres taller than me. Mm. But also I think uh, something that's very important is the, the muscle structure of the athlete. You hear about the, the slow and the fast twitch muscle fibres and the, the mixture of those. So, you know, these climbers, the time trialers, they're, um, they're mainly slow twitch muscle fibre athletes. And, you know, the faster guys obviously have more fast twitch muscle fibres. But you've got to have that right mix to be able to get through a long road race, get over a couple of mountains, get yourself back in the bunch and then be able to put a sprint on top of that at the end. Mm -hmm. We're talking with uh, a 12 times Tour de France rider, three times winner of the green jersey, Robbie McEwen on the High Performance Hour. So, I mean, were you naturally gifted straight away? You got on this road bike and, and, I mean, the time really, you were 18, 19 when you sort of took to road cycling. You were, what, 22 when you were first named in the Aussie team? So were you, were you straight away? Were you pretty good? Uh, I showed signs that I could be good. I was, um, I was naturally very fast. When I got on a road bike or on a track bike, I was, I was really quick. Um, but the problem was getting through any sort of distance and being able to show that speed at the finish. So that was the thing I had to work on right from day one. The speed was there. I knew I could go fast. It was a matter of getting to the finish. So what I really had to concentrate on was doing the kilometres and just slowly building up. I remember my first, well, in inverted commas, long ride was 40K, and I came home absolutely <laughs> smashed at the end of it. I couldn't stop eating. I got what they call a hunger flat where you run out of sugars, run out of energy. So, you know, it was, it was a long road to to get to the point where I could win races. And I was, you know, went up from C grade through B grade. Um, you know, the shorter races, I started to come to the fore, the criteriums, because I could get through an hour-long race. Then it was sort of getting through the road race and just building slowly but surely. And, and early in your career, I mean, that goes really, really quick. It's just a matter of putting in the time and doing the Ks. So in the Tour de France, Robbie, to win on the Champs-Élysées, which you're going to take us through later, but... You've got a, the first week's a lot of pressure for the sprinters. The flat stages generally, it's full gas. You guys have got to hit the tour, you know, in peak form almost. Then you've got to survive the mountains, ride through the mountains, and then somehow find the gas to win on the Champs Elysees. How do you get yourself up for that? Uh, well, I think, like you say, that the first week is, is massive pressure. That's where it's got to happen for the sprinters. It's uh, most of the flat stages are in the first week in general, except for this year's Tour de France. They were really spread out, but. Uh, you really want to win a stage in the first week and take the pressure off. You you go there to win and, you know, the more stages you ride and you still haven't won, the pressure builds and builds. If you have had a successful first week or even if you haven't, you're, you're looking towards the, the next opportunity, which might be 10 days away. Or if you're, you know, deep into the tour in the second week, the last and only chance might be on the Champs-Élysées. And you've just got to keep that in the back of your mind and, it, that makes all the suffering through the Alps and the Pyrenees worth it just to get there and have a crack on the Champs-Élysées. But uh, the thing is, when once you do get there, um, and it is a matter of revving yourself up again and, and you know, getting ready to do one last full gas sprint, the good thing is, I guess, is you're not sprinting, sprinting there against fresh guys. It's everyone else who's gone through the whole 3,500K of the Tour as well. So it's a bunch of dead bodies sprinting against each other. Mm. And, and uh, so, I, again, and you've emphasised it a few times, it is the ability for you to uh, have that endurance element as well, you know, because if, uh, I mean, have, have you come close to, uh, you know, missing out on, on the final stages in your 12 tours? Did you ever not get to the Champs-Élysées? Yeah, there was one tour I didn't make it to the Champs-Élysées. That was 2007. Uh, I crashed on the first day and I, I injured my knee and, and my wrist. Um it, for me, it was a successful tour because I won that first stage. I got up and, and won the stage, but my knee got worse and worse over the course of the first week. And by the time we got to the mountains, I couldn't even pedal anymore. Um, I refused to get off and give up, so I rode all the way to the finish on one of the alpine stages, but I was a long, long way outside the time limit, and then I was eliminated from the race and actually really glad to get out and go home because I was in agony. Mm. Um, so, I mean, before we talk about uh, riding the tour specifically and uh, and the Champs-Élysées, um, let's talk about family 
and uh, and the environment. Uh, typical Aussie family. I mean, were you out there doing everything as a as a kid, as a teenager? Tell us about that family background. Oh yeah, growing up, we were into absolutely everything. I, um, I grew up. I was born in Brisbane. Uh, grew up in Brisbane. Um, got two brothers, so we were really active, doing absolutely everything from from when I was a little kid. Oh, what did we do? We we played soccer. We did swimming. We did athletics. Did gymnastics. Um, BMX, um, every sport that was available at school, whatever you sort of get into or get our hands on, we'd do it. Um, you know, every afternoon after school was spent on the bikes doing jumps, or at least first building the jumps and then doing the jumps. Um, and then most weekends were spent at BMX tracks. So our parents were you know, running us around well, all over the country. We, we were going away doing national championships, so we were to to Cairns one year, Perth the next, Adelaide, Tasmania, we're all over the place. Uh, and I imagine with those bikes, was there a fair bit of driving? Was there a fair bit of time spent in the car with the family? Yeah, there was a fair bit of time in the in the big old van, so with all of us in there, mum, dad, the three kids, all the bikes, the, the eskies, the, the tent, everything packed up to go to the BMX meetings. And uh, But there were you know, hundreds of other families doing exactly the same thing and it was uh, I had a, a great youth doing that because you know, BMX was my passion, I just couldn't get enough of it. And luckily for me, my parents were really supportive and, uh, and worked really hard to enable us to do that. Our guest on the High Performance Hour is Robbie McEwen. As uh, we're going to build towards this uh, description of what it is to a uh, sprint down the Champs Elysees uh, to uh, win the green jersey because he's done that three times in his career. Hi, Paul from AV World. AV World have our best ever projector deal. Why buy a 75 inch TV that's 20 grand and no good on motion? We have an Optima 3D Full HD projector with a six speed color wheel for $19.99. These are made for sport and action movies and will give you up to a 300 inch picture. Full HD 3D projector with a three year warranty for $19.99. Get the movie experience at home at AV World, 237A Dominion Road, Mount Eden or avworld.co.nz. The original Aussie Butcher, fair dinkum quality. Even though he's the Aussie Butcher, he refuses to sell Aussie or any other beef except good old Kiwi stuff. Why? Because he knows the best beef comes from right here, like this week's deals. Fresh aged New Zealand quality mark rump steak, only $10.99 a kilo. The Aussie's own gold medal winning pure beef sausages, $9.99 a kilo. And fresh lamb shoulder chops, $9.99 a kilo. Get to the Aussie Butcher where it's all about the flavour, it's all about the taste. Flying out of Auckland? Leave your car with Aero Parts. There are lots of great reasons why. Take your pick. Your car will never leave the tar sealed site. You can make use of the showering and baby changing facilities. And of course, you'll be taken straight to the terminal for free. The best bit? You won't be charged huge prices. Choose Aero Parks. Book now to secure your space at aeroparks.co.nz or phone 0800 Aero Parks. The Hyundai High Performance Hour. Proudly brought to you by Hyundai New Zealand. This is the High Performance Hour. We're talking with Robbie McEwen. So, first tour, uh, 97? That's right. Um, so, you know, tell us how you approached that. Did you have a fair idea of what you're in for? By now you've ridden a few of the, the tours around the world. Did you know what this was going to be like? I knew it was going to be huge, but I didn't really know exactly what I was in for. Um, I went into the tour that year um, actually having come off a, a broken collarbone um, only six weeks before it, but I was riding well and I'd won a couple of races in the lead-up and I you know, I, I thought I was going to be fairly competitive, but um, I felt afterwards that I just got a kicking from start to finish. The race was so fast, so intense. Um, I thought the hardest thing for me was not the sprint. I felt like I had the speed in the sprints, but it was getting myself in position to be able to do an effective sprint. And the race, like I said, was so hard and so fast, the intensity so high that it was, um, for me, it was impossible to, to put myself in that position to, to give myself a chance in the sprints. But it was a, a massive learning curve you know, going in very first time. Um, I was just hoping I could get through it and reach Paris. And when I did, it was a very, very proud moment. Robbie, you, you talked about the family, the support as a kid in BMX, but who did you turn to, you know, during your career in Europe, often by yourself, just a, a, in a foreign team? Massive highs, but there must have been some amazing lows. So who was your support network around you to, to get you through those times? 
Well, it's it's interesting for for young riders, that especially from from this part of the world, southern hemisphere. You you turn pro, or you, you know, even as a good amateur, you go to Europe, and um, you sort of a bit left to your own devices. I went through the the Australian national team system. Uh, we had a very good support network, and you know a lot of mates in the team. But then you turn pro, and you're off with a foreign team, and um, that's when you've got to get really tough and be mentally strong to to get through the the down moments because you got these big pro teams and they're they're not your mum and dad and they're not your first coach and they expect performances and if things aren't going quite right they expect you to be able to turn it around fairly quickly they'll they'll help as much as they can and and advise but you it's not quite that same support network so you know for me it was um talking to some of the the older riders we had a couple of older riders uh, that there were Aussies um, in the peloton, but you'd only see them now and again. Um, for me, it was more keeping in contact with the home front. Um, my dad has, has always been a really good uh, support person and someone I could always turn to. He um, basically was my first coach as a BMX rider. Um, my dad was quite sporty when he was young, but um, he, was, he was a really good mentor. He's really level-headed, um, really logical in his thinking um and realistic and if anything was ever going wrong it's good to talk to him to get his perspective and, and and advice on how i could turn things around or just a bit of encouragement is always good and after that then it was my uh my girlfriend who is now my wife always gives you someone someone to talk to and it's it's good sometimes to talk to someone who's got absolutely nothing to do with the sport my wife had very little understanding of it but she saw the the personal side and uh, they they make you realise that it's not the be-all, end-all. There are other things and it can sort of take your mind off it and uh, that's refreshing as well. So at what point uh, did you feel comfortable? You talked about your first tour and, and the fact that, you know, a little bit uh, uh, perhaps naive even going into that first tour and, and thinking, yeah, I'll be OK, I'll sprint with the boys at the end of this, but then, wow, you realise what it's like. How, how many tours, how many years did it take for you to feel comfortable and feel at home? Um, even the second one, I, I felt more at home. I knew what I was in for and I, I still believed I could win. I think as an athlete, you've got to believe you can win. Um, I went into that tour going well. I had a second place, a third place in the first couple of days. Um, had some placings later on in the tour but wasn't able to win a stage. So, again, I came out of it sort of a bit disillusioned because I thought I was, you know, a year older, a year stronger, a year wiser, um, but I still didn't manage to, to win a stage. But I'd been so close that it, in a way, gave me more belief that it was possible because I just needed that, just that little bit more, maybe another year of experience, another year of strength, um, just a touch of luck maybe, and, a, and I'd be able to jag one. It took me until the very last day of my third Tour de France to finally get a win in the Tour de France. It's interesting because, you know, we, and we've got a number of New Zealanders. Uh, how many have we had, roughly, that have ridden the Tour? We've had 11 in total. Le- oh, roughly, we're, and he we're knows still, the answer uh, straight away. still searching for our first stage winner. Uh, in, individual. Individual, we've, yes. We had team yep. with Chris Jenner and Julian. But, um, yeah, we're still searching for that individual stage stage winner and... So, so many of the Kiwis, though, and I think of them this year, that uh, that when you are first introduced to a team and riding the Tour de France, typically your role is one of fetcher and carrier and worker. Domestique, I guess, is the term, Del, is it? That's correct. Uh, yep. for, on, for on the Tour. But as a sprinter, you, you're not even given that role, are you? Or, or are you? I don't know. As a youngster, but a sprinter, because you, you're not necessarily going to have the uh, the capability of doing some of that work, are you? Yeah, well, I was thrown in as the team sprinter, so you, you're one of the team captains for the flat stages. I was the man, and that's that's a fair bit to take on for a, you know, what was I, 25 when I started my first tour. Um, you know, in a team of, you know, big-name riders and you're up against the, you know, the massive favourites uh, in the sprints. Like, you know, I was going there against, uh, like we said, Cipollini, Sabal, the guys who'd been there and done it all before, they were the dominant sprinters of the time. Um, so, yeah, I didn't have that that helper's role, uh, was do the sprints, be the, the team leader on that day, and for the rest, just try and get through it. Which is um, interesting because, in a way, if you are if, if a young rider is included in the tour and, and they are a helper, they are a domestique, there's less pressure on them, Del. 
I, I think, in a way, because they don't have to be at the front of the peloton, you know, in those critical stages. Their job is earlier on. Their job is doing the, the hard yards, but then they can, you know, ride off the back. But you didn't have that luxury. You, you So mentally, how did you cope with that, that you were thrown into a, a role of quite some responsibility very early? I actually really enjoyed it because that's what I'd always had since I was a kid. I've always been going for the win and had that pressure, especially coming out of a sport like BMX where it's down to split-second decisions and the, the margins are so tiny. Um, you know, if you fluffed your gate start in BMX, it was all over, you're eighth out of eight. Um, I think having that as a, as a background and knowing that pressure from going to national championships and state championships, um, that, you know, once I got to senior level at, and at the Tour de France, I was, I would have been really disappointed if I didn't have that role, if I didn't have that pressure that goes along with it because I've always thrived on it. How did your teammates accept you, Robert? You're, you know... Young Aussie hotshot comes into a, a European team, European riders, guys that are you know got GC aspirations. You're there telling them what to do. The management wants success. They want you to win a stage in the first week because they want the pressure taken off them. But what sort of respect did they give you, and how did they get behind you? I was actually really good. Uh, I think because I wasn't just thrown for the very first time into that situation at the Tour de France, but I'd ridden a number of races from the start of the season, and my very first pro win. Uh, in 96 was in front of um, three riders who'd all won stages at the Tour de France. So right from you know the, the first month of my contract, I, I had the respect of my teammates because they'd seen as a, as a you know, new pro coming in and beating those established riders uh, sort of first day out more or less. Um, they gave me that immediate sort of position in the team that, well, we know he can, he can do it. But, of course, there's going from, you know, riding that race that I won in Spain in front of those guys to riding the Tour de France. It is another step up. And and you do have to earn the respect of not only your rivals but also your teammates because they've got to feel it's worth working for you. Is is there... I'm always fascinated in, uh, uh, I guess, the the crossover somewhere between confidence, arrogance, swagger and, you know, you've got to be a bit bulletproof in elite sport, especially, it seems, in the power events. You look at the 100-metre sprinters. I mean, that is just an ego fest, watching the start of an Olympic 100 metres final. And, and, but you've got to have that confidence. Did you have it early on or did you have to develop it? No, I always had it. Um, you know, I knew that on some days in some races uh, there were riders who at the time were going to be near on impossible to beat for me. But in, in my mind, I always backed myself as being just as quick. I knew I could if I could start from the right place or really get a good crack at them. Um, some days maybe that wasn't completely realistic, but you've got to believe in yourself, and I always did. And like you say, it's a, it's a mixture of the, the confidence and the arrogance. You've got to have a bit. You've got to, as a sprinter, believe uh, and make the others believe that you've got to you belong that. there more than they do. Yep. That's my spot. Get out of the way. Mm. You're wasting my time. Mm. We're talking with Robbie McEwen on the High Performance Hour. When we come back, we'll take you down the Champs-Élysées and uh, just take you through exactly what is involved in a sprint finish at the Tour de France. G'day, your old mate, the Mad Butcher. This week, it's the big, fresh New Zealand lamb salad at all Mad Butcher stores. With legs of lamb, just $10.99 a kilo. Boneless, butterfied lamb legs for just $16.99 a kilo. Lamb racks, skin on, just $19.99 a kilo. And lamb shoulder chops, a steal at just $8.99 a kilo. That's right, lamb shoulder chops, only $8.99 a kilo. Lamb loin chops down to $11.99 a kilo. It's fresh New Zealand lamb in all Mad Butcher stores this week. They're kings of motor bodies, there's nothing they can do. They'll fix your truck or soup it up, it'll come out just like new. When it comes to your truck repairs, the Kingsford team will have you tracking along again with as little downtime as possible. With 30 years' experience, their workmanship and materials are guaranteed. Very competitive pricing and no obligation quotes. See Grant and his team today on McLaughlin's Road, Witty. Kingsford Motor Bodies, there's nothing they can do. Take in your truck, they'll do it up, there's nothing they can't do.
IRL Pipes bring you the finest pipes from around the world. The Bagpipes, the instrument you either love or hate. Although synonymous with Scotland, bagpipes have been played for centuries throughout large parts of Europe, the Persian Gulf and Africa. Bagpipes were once used by the Scots to scare away their enemies on the battlefield. However, bagpipes were actually banned in Scotland twice in 1560 and 1740. IRL Pipes don't play the bagpipes, but they are the experts in installing industrial piping. Visit IRLPipes.co.nz The Hyundai High Performance Hour with Andrew Dewhurst. Proudly brought to you by Hyundai New Zealand. This is the High Performance Hour. Robbie McEwen, our guest, uh, Del Woodford, with me in studio as well. Um, Let's let's talk about a sprint finish. And and if you can, put our audience onto that bike with you. Um, Goodness knows there's not enough room. Um, I mean, we've seen this year with just how physical it gets. But if you can, just take us through that final stage. So set it up first. And again, just tell us physically how you are feeling. This is at the end of 19, 20, 21 stages. Tell us how you're feeling before you even start the final stage. Well, every year is different, but mainly it's just pure exhaustion and you want it to be over and done with. Um, the tour is a funny thing. You can you can get to the end being like a zombie. You you feel like you can't pedal anymore. You just you want it to be done and you, you haven't got any energy. Other years you'll come in feeling actually quite okay. And I've had a mixture of everything through that last day, but um, you know, everybody's tired. So you can sort of console yourself with, with that fact that everybody's in the same boat pretty much. You're a little bit more nervous? Always nervous going into the last day as a sprinter because it's the last chance and this is what all the suffering's been for. You, know, you pushed yourself through the Pyrenees and through the Alps and made the time limits and done all that suffering just so you can get a crack at that final sprint up the Champs-Élysées. So all that that stress and all that suffering has been sort of packed into this one last effort and you really don't want to stuff it up because you've done so much to get there. And the Champs-Élysées is is quite a difficult sprint. It's quite technical at the finish, much more technical than nearly any other stage in the Tour because of the the nature of the course, the the last few corners, um, the positioning, and that's... Say it again. That one of the most important things in sprinting is positioning. It's it's not always how fast you are, but it's where you can manage to start from and who you've got to put you there. Okay, so I mean, it's it's the last hundred meters that get replayed on the news, but uh, in reality, where does the sprint start? And what I mean is, when are you setting up for the sprint? Well, on the Champs Elysees, you start to set up a couple of laps out. So you're doing laps up and down the Champs Elysees. It's about six, six and a half k around, um, and you do ten laps. So you know, a few laps out, you've you've moved yourself and your teammates up towards the front, stay out of trouble because you know if things things split, someone loses the wheel. Um, when you're coming out of a the U-turn up the top of the the Arc de Triomphe, you don't want to get on that what they call the big elastic band where the bunch slows down going into that U-turn, accelerates out, and then you're put in a long single-file line. You want to be near the front, conserving energy as much as possible. And it really, really goes down going into that last 6K, everyone jostling for position, teams trying to take control of the front. Um, But the train's also setting up to hit the front from a place where they know they can maintain it all the way through to the finish. So you're trying to stay together and be able to get out from where you are and hit the front when you want to. And there's a lot of manoeuvring that goes into that because you've got three, four, five other trains all coming around. It's like a, a great big washing machine at the front. There's riders coming up the outside, moving to the middle. They go back through the middle as others come around them. And it takes a lot of nous for a team to stick together and protect the sprinter and be able to get him out and hit the front when they want to do it. So the guy who's in first position of those, say, six riders, he's really got to know his stuff and um, it's it's riding as if you're 10 metres long and considering what's happening to the, the last guy in the line. So you've got your team lined up. There's other teams going down the outside, the inside, trying to push you off. You're sitting there, last wheel on your team. How do you not panic when a team's coming past you? You must be tempted to go, well, I'll just jump on them because they're looking better than my team at the moment. So you've got to have absolute faith. Or do you make that split decision and panic and change sides? Well, if you know you haven't really got the team who could pull the sprint all the way to the finish line, you've got to pick another team, pick the strongest train um, with possibly the fastest sprinter 
um, a reliable train, one that you know with more often than not that they'll get there and you can switch on to them. But say you're, you're Mark Cavendish um, or Andre Greipel, um, you know, with he's sitting on Greg Henderson as his uh, last lead-out man. They've got four others in front of them. They know their trains can get them there and they have complete faith in them that those guys will do the right thing. Because that's, that's what those teams are set up for, yeah? Exactly. Everyone's got their, their job to do. And and I know that, uh, well, I talk about Greg Henderson, he's he's become a bit of a master of the lead-out train and, and conducting what's going on. The sprinter should only have to think about his sprint and nothing else. So you've got the guy in front of you driving the rest of that group. And so he's making the tactical decisions for the sprinter almost. Yeah, your little adjustments he'd be making to, to say if they're going to go a little bit earlier or a little bit later or switch to the right or switch to the left. But mainly the tactic has been made before the race and you know that each rider can only go a certain distance. So if you're going to, you can work backwards. You say, well, your sprinter, you don't want to go from more than 200 metres to go. So your last guy has to get him to there. Well, that guy's only got 250 metres in him, so that gets you back to 450. The guy before him might do 300, that's back to 750. So by the time you you get back to about a kilometre, you've used four guys to get through to the finish line. So it's no good starting with four guys at 3K to go because you're just not going to make it. So that's what everyone's got in their mind. They've got their markers. So the first guy in a six-man train, he'll generally do a, a longer turn, not at absolute full speed but very high speed but he might get 800 meters before he swings off and goes across to the next guy so everyone has their marker and each team will know their little tactic so lotto will try and do it like that they'll hit the front about 2k out and try and pull it all the way through to the line where you've got marcel kittel the german guy who won four stages in this year's tour They've got fewer guys to use in a lead-out train. They've probably had two or three guys. He just seems to they'd appear. Hang, they'd hang back yeah. but really stick together with those two or three and they'd ride off the other teams until the very last moment where it's possible to pass to hit the front and take it through to the line. So they were trying to go from six or 700 metres out. So you've got all these different tactics of trains depending on how many guys they've got, how far they can manage to get. Can you give us some numbers? I mean, A, in terms of speed of the bike. So let's assume you're on the last lap uh, on the Champs-Élysées. What speed is the front of the peloton doing and, and heart rate? Do you know what your heart rate's doing? And and, and is that a factor for you? It, or, or are you literally just emptying the tank and you've put aside some of that sports science at this yeah, point? Yeah, that sports science doesn't come into it anymore. You're trying to save energy as much as possible and just stay out of the wind because you know it's just going to blow your legs up. But heart rate-wise, through the last lap, you'd be hovering around the 180. When you go through to the sprint, you're, you know, you're absolutely maxing out above 190. And if you consider at the end of the tour, your, your maximum heart rate is probably 15 beats lower than when you're fresh at the beginning of the tour just because your heart as a muscle is also tired. Mm. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're hovering around 180 beats a minute. You're coming down from the Arc de Triomphe, the opposite side of the finish line. Um, you'd be doing a good... 60 to 64 k an hour and it's it's quite a little downhill section but a good 60 k an hour all the way through is this on cobbles or is that's on those little cobbles and they are a lot rougher than they look on tv that you really get some bounce through them um you often see guys puncture um which is a terrible way to have to finish the tour if you puncture with three or four k to go out of three and a half thousand um and you have to sort of just you know dribble in over the line with (laughs) get after getting a spare wheel but as you're coming down uh, that, that downhill, you come onto the flat section opposite the finish line, that's where it really starts to go down. You've got a hard right-hander onto the opposite side of the Place de la Concorde. That's where you've really got to be in position. The sprinters need to be in the first 20 there because you don't want to be wasting energy trying to move up anymore. You come into another sharp left-hander where it changes from the cobbles onto nice smooth asphalt. It's the nicest place to be. Every single lap you get there is sort of a, oh, finally back on some asphalt because it's really quite rough the rest of it. You swing left again and underneath the tunnel, uh, underneath the, the, the gardens up above, and you see them fly up out of the tunnel and, uh, and into the left-hander at the big Ferris wheel. You know, you're on your, your last chance really to, to make amends for any mistakes or move up. The race is moving there at, at 60 plus. The lead-out trains are starting to go because you're only a kilometre and a half from the line. And as you come, un- come under the kilometre banner... That's where it's all going down. Um, lead-out trains are down to their last three guys and you're really trying, after you pass under the kilometre, the road swings a little bit to the left. You hit the Place de la Concorde, back onto the cobbles. 
you're coming past the big fountain, it gets a little bit, it funnels in, it gets narrow, so there's not room for everybody. And then you're already starting to line up for that last corner, which is very, very important. The place to be with your team is right on the front. You've got your third last man pulling as hard as he can, can across the Place de la Concorde, ready to hand over to the second last guy who will swing it through the last corner. Now, if you're trying to pass, trying to move up, if you're on the right-hand side, the big danger is you're going to get closed down into that last right-hander and it's ruined the whole sprint for your for your guy. So you need to be on the left-hand side to keep any sort of momentum. If you're going to win on the Champs-Élysées, you've got to come through the last corner at least in the first four or you're not going to stand a chance. And this year when we saw the Argos Shimano team of Marcel Kittel lead through the last corner with still with two guys in front of Kittel, the last big lead out, they got him to 200, 220 metres to go and he just went for it. The only two that even got close to going with him was Cavendish and Greipel. And I thought it was just a, a, a beautiful sprint to watch because he is so hard to pass. He's so big. He's so powerful. He looks like the big uh, Russian guy out of Rocky Five, mm. even Drago. <laughs> and you know, uh, you know, Greipel and Cavendish, two of the fastest guys in the world, and those three sprinters have dominated all the bunch sprints in 2013. So it was fitting to see those three going head-to-head up the Champs-Élysées and to see Kittle win. It was like a, a breath of fresh air you know, after the dominance of Cavendish over the last few years. Even Sagan, who won green, it was more of a points jersey this year than a sprint jersey. He was a, a distant fourth. But as you're coming up out of that last corner, it's 350 metres to go. So you know, if you're not coming out of there and at least sort of third of the sprinters, you know, one lead out guy in front of that, um, you're not in with a chance because it's all over within 20 seconds. And it's uh, it's not a lot of time to make up even a couple of lengths when they're already doing 71k an hour. And and how physical? We see the butting of heads, we see the shoulder contact. How, how physical? You know, those. whenever you see a bit of butting heads or bumping of shoulders, it's actually not that hard. It wouldn't even push you sideways on your chair. But it's all about a balancing act. Uh, like I say, between 60 and 70k an hour, it only takes a tiny little mistake for it to be absolute carnage and guys spread all over the road. Um Nobody wants to go down at that speed. Nobody wants to cause a crash and take down, you know, 30 or 40 other riders at that speed. So it's only really little touches and it's, it's more manoeuvring than than real physical bumping. And it can be a, a little push, but it's it's more about putting the other guy off, getting him to back off first. Mm. Who's going to back off because they're worried about going down? So, you know, the, the pushing's really quite light, but... um. You push them in the right place, then it has a good effect. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, obviously the, the the power plant is is the legs, the quads. Um, I, I assume. I mean, have you had situations where you literally? I mean, cyclists talk about talk about bonking. Is that the term, Del? Where you're on a bike and you're just completely gone, nothing yep. left, blackout. I mean, have you reached a point on a, on a bike in a sprint situation like that where literally the legs go, uh, uh-uh, uh, no more. Yeah, well, what you're talking about there is when you just completely lactate. You get the lactic acid just fills your system. Everything goes to jelly. Um, you know, I've sprinted until I've seen black stars in front of my eyes and uh, and could not go one more metre. But um, you know, your body's always going to switch off before your mind does. Your mind wants it to go and your body has – it's like a safety switch. Mm. You, know, you put too much electricity through something with a safety switch, it flicks off and your body will do the same. But, you know, you can push it at – you know, pretty far before it'll do that and you know, the pain you can put yourself in in a sprint. But that's you've got to be able to go that, that little bit harder, that little bit longer to hurt yourself that little bit more before you, you back off. And if your brain can force that, that extra ounce of energy out, it could mean winning a sprint by a millimetre. And it's enough. You might not be able to get up the steps to get on the podium after it. But <laughs> who cares? Who, who cares couple, if you've won? There's, there's a couple of pretty girls to help you up there, so you'll be right. You'll be right. Oh, it's, it's amazing. Del, have you got anything else on that? Uh, just hearing that, you know, on the Champs-Élysées, coming down 71 kilometres an hour, Robbie, you're sitting there 300 to go. You know, how do you find you're doing 71k an hour? Where does that extra speed mm. come from and when do you want to hit the front knowing you can hang on I mean obviously get, and, and I'll be interested to add into that question the gearing because obviously you've, you've set the bike up for this as well yeah yeah uh, most most guys when you're going you know, 
top sprinters will pretty much all run a 53.11. Some guys, some big guys, really strong, might run a 54.11. Um, and if they're, if they're really big, longer cranks, gives them a bit more leverage on it. So I myself rode 170 cranks, which almost nobody does. I think myself and Mark Cavendish were the only ones that were running that length cranks. Um, most others run 172 and a half millimetre. So what does that mean in layman's terms? It means um, you've got to have the a longer, real power plant. The longer plant. The, the cranks, the more leverage, but you you can achieve less revolutions. Yep. So, you know, the smaller guys and shorter cranks, it, it makes the gear feel harder because you've got a shorter lever, but you can get more leg speed. Mm. So it's it's all about what's the, the right sort of uh, geometry for your body and what you feel good with, um, what you're confident on. Um, so yeah, fifty three eleven is a, is pretty common gearing. Um, you now when you're coming coming into the sprint, you're uh, between sixty nine and seventy three, depending on the road, the surface, the wind, all that sort of stuff, and you're sprinting at really cr- close quarters. Um, now even sometimes I, I like to sprint really close to the others because it was off putting for them. If you can get someone to lose that tiny bit of concentration to take their mind off the effort they're making to think, oh, no, he's getting really close, I'm going to have to move. Or, that'd, that'd be enough, they'd be that's, gone, wouldn't that's they? That's good, so you don't have mm. to hit somebody, but it's also worked against me where I got too close to someone, got a shoulder in front of me and uh, I finished behind him, I lost the green jersey. That was in 2003 in Paris. So uh, everybody's got their tactics. I mean, I was a, a sprinter who liked to come out of the slipstream um, in the, the final metres of the race, so I'd start making my run from you know, 150 or 120 metres out, sometimes I'd only get there right on the line. Or you've got someone like uh, like Greipel or Kittel who like to just go from the front, they'll just pound it out from, you know, over 200 metres to go and basically dare anyone else to pass them just because they're, they're really big, powerful guys, um, long, high-speed sprint. And I think that's what, what makes it really good to watch. You've got the different types of sprinters. They're all sprinters, but... Guys do it in a different way. You've got the guys who go more long range, guys who are more explosive over a short distance like like I was. Um, Cavendish, he's a really interesting one because he seems to be able to do it all. He can go from the front and go long range and hold everybody off with his super aerodynamic position. But he can also come out of the wheel and just jump over them in the in the final 80 or 100 metres. Mm. Um, and they're the, the kind of sprints I like to watch is not the sort of predictable... Sprint train taking them towards the finish. Last guy pulls over, sprinter goes through, everything stays in the same order, pretty boring. I like to see something interesting happening. I like a good tactic. Um, I like to see someone maybe take the, the final corner, which might technically be too far from the finish, but they take it so hard, dive bomb underneath somebody, get a gap and, and hold and them go. off, things like that.